Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the physicians committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the healthiest half hour anywhere online today. Appreciate you joining us right here on Facebook and YouTube as we do our best to educate, enlighten, and inspire for the next 30 minutes or so. On tap today, it is the eve of the International Conference of on Nutrition and Medicine, ICNM 2020, and we are going to be joined by one of the featured speakers. And you, yes, you watching this right now, get to steer the ship because today is gut health Q&A day. And for that, we are opening up the doctor's mailbag with the one and only Dr. Alan Desmond. Dr. Desmond, this is going to be fantastic. So I'm very much looking forward to having you tackle a whole bunch of your questions today. And you who is watching this, if you have any question about biome, gut health, go in the comments right now. And tweet them to us using the hashtag exam room podcast. Uh, also today, also today, before we up, I want to remind you that ICNM is in fact tomorrow. You can subscribe to it right now. Register with a 20% discount using the promo code exam room 20 over at pcrm.org slash ICNM. And we will get you set up with a 20% discount just exclusive for exam room live viewers. Also on the show today, we will be wrapping up with a check on health headlines and an interesting new study about blueberries and muscle health. And some new reports show that it actually pays. Yes maybe even saves to be vegan right now. We'll clue you in toward the end of the show. Really amazing comparison of the cost of fruits and vegetables to meats and dairy as the pandemic continues. So we'll be doing that toward the end of the show. But start things off today with Dr. Neil Barnard here on The Exam Room Live. Looking ahead to the fall, Dr. Barnard and the coronavirus, people are wondering what's gonna happen when flu season hits. Is it going to get worse? So what do we know? What is the latest there, sir? Yeah, uh, great question, Chuck. And I have to say, everyone is, is really thinking about this. Um, let me maybe just go back to where we were and see how the predictions have changed. Uh, remember when we got started talking about all of this in the springtime, it was the very end of December, it came into China, then it started spreading over to Europe, ended up in the US. And right around the middle of April, everything was, was heating up. We were having uh, just a huge death rate. However, the prediction at that time was it would settle down. You remember the idea of being back in the malls by Easter and by summertime with the warm weather, this was all supposed to be finished. Uh, here are the latest uh, statistics as of today from the University of Washington. And what this is, is the death rate. The reason we're looking at, death, at deaths is people will say, well, could changes in how often we are testing, could that change the figures? Well. If you're dead or alive from COVID-19, it's pretty hard to argue with those numbers. So it, it, indeed, it was a terrible peak back in the middle of April. But what happened? It did scale down, but it did, did not scale down to zero. And then right around the 1st of July, everything started going in the wrong direction. It started going up and up and up. And now I've got to tell you, that according to the University of Washington and all the evidence we've had, we are gonna hover right around a thousand deaths per day, every day. Now, the prediction can be changed. If you look out on the right of this graph, that line in the middle is what we think is actually gonna happen. And it'll tail down a little bit, um, you know, maybe down 800, 700 uh, deaths a day, uh, if we're lucky. The green line at the bottom, that's the optimistic scenario. That's if everybody continues doing what they were supposed to have been doing, wearing a mask, staying inside, no reopenings. That's the most optimistic scenario. Even that doesn't get anywhere near zero. The worst case scenario is the one that you see at the top. That's the little dotted line uh, in, in red. And that's if everybody gets impatient and eager and uh, things start reopening faster than they can and people aren't wearing a mask. Um, so again, where we think it's gonna be is, is right in the middle. So it'll probably tail down a little bit, but by no means go away. And where this graph ends is around November 1st. And by November 1st, we expect to have a death count of 230,000. That's just a couple months away, right? Okay, so what's gonna change all this? How are we gonna be able to, to change the scenario, as, as you can see, they're, 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 to answer your question, Chuck, is 
nothing is going to change uh, as the flu season comes in. On top of COVID, we'll have flu. Um, the government has launched what it's calling Operation Warp Speed. The idea is to get a vaccine. But instead of the old fashioned way of slowly testing a vaccine and releasing it to the public, the idea is to do it as fast as possible. So the government launched tests on 125 possible vaccines. They've shrunk that list down dramatically. We've now got five uh, that, that are looking, they're good, they're good at least in theory. Uh, one is made, made, made by Moderna, one by BioNTech, one by Merck, one by Johnson & Johnson, and the fifth one by AstraZeneca. They all have something, they're all different techniques, but they all have something in common. You see those yellow spikes on the coronavirus particle? That's what they are attacking. They want you, your body to be able to make antibodies to recognize those spikes and knock out the virus. Um, however, several things have to happen. First is it's got to work. So with the vaccines, we are seeing that they do seem to stimulate an immune response, meaning that in a person who has been exposed to the vaccine, we've got an immune response. Our body is making antibodies that look like they're hitting the virus. But then you also have to show that in real life, it will work. Um, you have to also show that it's safe. Now, there's been a big controversy going for years between vaccine proponents and so-called anti-vaxxers um, saying whether vaccines are safe or dangerous. I have to say that I think it's a little bit of an artificial debate because the truth is that vaccines are both. They do wonderful good, as we saw from the polio vaccine and many, many others. They really do, do stop these problems. They also cause problems. There are, have been cases of polio caused by the vaccine. And back when I was a medical student, uh, the swine flu vaccine caused a terrible uh, neurological problem called Guillain-Barre uh, syndrome uh, that fortunately was temporary for many people, but it, was, it, uh, it, ca it caused the vaccine scientists great anguish to discover that their vaccines could hurt people. So vaccines are both. They are a great aid, but they are also dangerous and they do have to be tested very, very carefully so that they're gonna be released uh, appropriately. Then, once you get to, to a vaccine that is effective and safe, you have to make it. You have to distribute it. You have to administer it. All that will take time. So what does that mean? That means it's important to remember that the idea of warp speed was popularized by Star Trek and by science fiction in general. And the emphasis is fiction. So warp really stands for we aren't really predicting. But see where we get and hopefully we'll have a vaccine soon. There you go, Chuck. All right, I appreciate that update and uh, happy ICNM Eve. I know that you have to be excited. This is uh, the most exciting for me anyway, the most exciting three days out of the year. It is gonna be great. We have uh, at last count uh, between eight and 900 uh, people who are joining us and uh, thank you for inviting more people to join it. And if you do fasten your seatbelt, we've got that very top level science uh, coming in for people. And I'm so delighted that Dr. Alan Desmond, who's been a hero of mine since I first met him in Australia and learned of the wisdom that he has brought to Crohn's disease, to gut diseases in general, it's going to be just a, a great, great conference. Uh, I, I absolutely can't wait. And uh, reminder, uh, it's not too late to register right now, but it is the final day to save with that 20% discount using the promo code EXAM20, lowercase exam20. Head over to pcrm.org slash ICNM to register today and also get a full list of speakers. Uh, Dr. Barnard, thank you very much. Can't wait to check in with you tomorrow, my friend. You bet. I'll stand by. All right, now it is time to get a little bit dirty here on the exam room live, and we are going to take a deep dive into the gut with the one and only Dr. Alan Desmond as we open up the doctor's mailbag today. Now, there are a couple ways that you can send in your questions. You can either post them in the comments as you have been doing, or you can send them to us on Twitter or Instagram using the hashtag exam room podcast. Dr. Desmond, if you're unfamiliar, he is a consultant gastroenterologist and an ambassador for plant-based health professionals UK, otherwise known as just the man who knows what's happening with the gut. And so with that, I ask, what's happening, Dr. Desmond? How are you today, my friend? I'm good, Chuck. Lovely to be back with you. And thank you very much to Dr. for his kind words. Um, I really, really appreciate that. And thank you for having me with you again today. It's just lovely, lovely to be here. 
Oh, I'm I'm so thrilled that you are here, and I'm equally as thrilled that you're going to be speaking at ICNM 2020 here in just a couple of days. Uh, I think are you speaking on Friday? Is that when you're speaking? Um, I'm speaking two days. I'm speaking tomorrow um, during the opening session. I'll be speaking about inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease. And on day two, I'll also be speaking in the early session um, just this really nice story about how earlier this year we helped 100 health professionals to reduce their personal cardiovascular risk by adopting, you guessed it, a healthy whole food plant-based diet for just 28 days. And along the way, they learned a lot about the power of lifestyle medicine and maybe learned something about how they can help their patients to get better without just using a prescription pad or maybe without using a prescription pad. So that will be on day two. You mentioned Crohn's disease, and that's something you and I had the opportunity to talk about on the Exam Room podcast recently, uh, really went into depth there. And it wasn't until fairly recently that I started to see studies about the benefits of a plant-based diet uh, with patients who have Crohn's disease. What do we know about the benefit there? Well, we've known that Crohn's disease is intricately related to dietary choices for decades, actually. So even when I was just out of medical school, I think there was an editorial in the British Medical Journal that was titled something like IBD time to cut out the meat because the epidemiological data was at that time becoming quite you know, quite noticeable. In the last few years, we've really seen this enter the mainstream of the gastroenterology world in our mainstream journals. But we, as, um, as we've westernized or Americanized or industrialized our food systems in the latter half of the 20th century and moved to a high meat, high fat, high dairy, high processed food, high junk food diet, low plant diet, we've seen conditions like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis really emerging and becoming really very common uh, just right alongside things like heart disease and type 2 diabetes and obesity. And in many cases, Chuck, you won't be surprised to learn that the same foods that are driving those other chronic inflammatory conditions also have a lot to do with chronic inflammatory bowel conditions like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. I remember you were talking about that uh, with me on the podcast and, and just being kind of blown away there. And then you were also talking about a specific uh, case study, I think, that you did with Dr. Hanna Kaliova uh, regarding, uh, was it a med student who had Crohn's disease and, and changed his diet and saw remarkable improvement? Yeah, that's right. And I'll be presenting um, some other similar cases during the uh, conference. But this a year ago since I published this paper with Dr. Bernard and Hannah Kaliova. And although we just had we had just one patient story in there, and obviously the evidence goes far beyond individuals, but people People need to hear individual stories so they can make it relatable. And this was a medical student who'd been diagnosed with Crohn's disease, and he was on the usual medication and he was doing relatively okay, but he entered remission, clinical remission, for the first time when he was advised by a friend that he should explore this whole concept of a whole food plant-based diet. And I think he initially did it for about six weeks and noticed a substantial improvement and ultimately entered clinical remission. And with the approval of his gastroenterologist was able to reduce his use of medication. And that was an opportunity for me and Dr. Bernard and Dr. Kaliova, not only to share that individual's story, but also to publish a nice review of the existing evidence um, around the effect that these highly processed foods and animal-based foods and high-fat foods have on the human gastrointestinal tract. I mean, in, in that presentation, as, as tomorrow in my presentation at the conference, we'll be focusing right in on Crohn's disease, but really it's a broader message about good gut health, Chuck. Yeah, that good gut health. And there is no shortage of questions right now just about that. So let's open up that doctor's mailbag and show that, yes, indeed, a healthy gut is a happy gut. So our first question comes to us from Lynn at 1209. She writes, I love kimchi. The one I buy states the serving is only two tablespoons. Is that enough to help with my microbiome? Well, there's... Um... Uh, is it enough to help with your gut microbiome? So when we look at studies of the effects of food, fermented foods, 
and shall we say probiotic supplements on the human gut microbiome. When you look at the studies of the effects of a healthy whole food plant-based diet, so the sort of foods that you might enjoy on the PCRM Kickstart program or on any healthy whole food plant-based uh, program, what we see is that within days, the human gut microbiome starts adapting and changing with this new healthier approach to food and absolutely loves that diversity of plants and that diversity of fiber. Fiber. We can measure the benefits. We can see fecal markers of inflammation going down. We see fecal markers of health, like your um, content of uh, short chain fatty acids going up. We even see harmful substances like TMA, which leads to TMAO dropping off. And those are very dramatic when you make the change to a healthy whole food plant based diet. Very, very dramatic indeed. When you look at the studies trying to demonstrate the benefit of taking a fermented food, or a probiotic supplement, when you look at those studies, the changes, Chuck, that the researchers are able to demonstrate are, to be quite honest, pretty minor. So when I am advising people to make healthy changes in their dietary approach, I'm all about the diversity of plants. I'm all about beans, greens, uh, whole grains, nuts and seeds and fruits and vegetables. I would view these uh, fermented foods, even like kimchi. I mean, I like kimchi, but I like it for its complex flavors and what it brings my plate. Um, I don't depend upon things like kimchi, sauerkraut, et cetera, uh, to bring me improvements in my gut microbiome. I depend on my fruits, vegetables, and whole grains to do that. So the other issue is, of course, the ferments like uh, kimchi are really quite high in salt. So if you're going to eat a whole lot of them, you're going to be really ramping up your intake of salt, which can have adverse effects on your blood pressure, for example, but can also has been linked to causing uh, gastric cancer. Uh, particularly if you already have an infection in your tummy, uh, which is called H. pylori, which is relatively common in certain, certain ethnicities. So enjoy those two tablespoons of kimchi. Enjoy those lovely complex flavors. But if you're looking to improve the diversity of your human gut microbiome with food, then it's all about the diversity of plants in your diet, not how much fermented foods you're eating. There's a few other things you can do beyond food to increase your gut microbial diversity, though, Chuck. And we can talk about those too if you'd like. Uh, absolutely. Uh, but first, let's piggyback on that question. Uh, this one is from Jay Anderson, also at 1209, wants to know, how do you feel about taking probiotics if we're eating a plant exclusive diet? Is it even necessary or beneficial? Well, the way that question has been framed makes me think that I'm on the same page as the person who just questioned. I don't see them as being healthy, beneficial, or necessary if you're eating a healthy whole food plant-based diet. There are a few very specific clinical scenarios within my practice where I will prescribe very specific probiotics for a short period of time. Um, but really those are you know, maybe several times per year rather than every single day. But every single day I'm asking my patients how much fruit and vegetables and whole grains they consume and looking for ways to increase. Again, the studies on taking probiotic supplements don't convince me at all that they are necessary for human health. Um, like a lot of things, Chuck, there's a lot of money here. The probiotic industry is worth billions. Um, taking a probiotic each day is also kind of got that nice simple reassurance. I'll just take this pill or the potion or this capsule and that will fix everything. But genuinely, I, when people ask me about probiotics, I say, keep that money and take it to the produce section and get yourself some, you know, some lovely fresh produce instead. It'll have a more measurable and more beneficial effect on your gut microbiome and you'll enjoy it more. Interesting question here from 1211. Does eating spicy food have any negative effects on the microbiome? So not specifically on the human gut microbiome. I mean, your microbiome just in its diversity. So the, the greater the variety of plants in your diet, the more diverse your human microbiome is going to be. And th that's really important. The human gut microbiome, these bacteria and viruses and archaea and yeasts that live within our arch bowel have been described by researchers as a control center for human biology. Think about that, a control center for human biology can influence that, that 
control center, we can dial it up and dial it down every day just by choosing to eat a healthy variety of plants. If you're putting spices, like should we say turmeric or, or anything else in there, you're just increasing the diversity. So I know that for some people, if they have too much spicy food, maybe the heat and the irritant properties um, may cause them some indigestion or gas. That's a whole other issue. But in terms of your use, human gut microbiome, I don't think if you're consuming uh, spices in normal dietary concentrations, you're going to run into any trouble. Liz, at 1212, what are the worst things that we can eat to destroy gut health? Is eating it long term or even eating it even once? I'm trying to go whole food plant based, but I still eat meat once or twice a week. My real vice, however, is cheese and chips. Cheese and chips, oh dear. Well, first of all, Liz, let's not make progress or let's not make perfection the enemy of progress. So it looks to me like you're eating a healthy whole food plant-based diet, probably like 20 meals out of 21 per week. So well done. You've made some really, really positive changes. And you're going to be able to measure those in terms of your health. You're going to be able to measure those in terms of your gut microbial diversity. So what are the worst things to take for your gut microbiome? I'm going to go with eggs because of all the choline, which will help your gut to make TMA made by your gut microbiome. That's absorbed very quickly and your liver turns it into TMAO, which increases systemic inflammation, risk of atherosclerosis, stroke, heart disease, et cetera. So I'm gonna say eggs and I'm gonna say red meat. Why am I saying red meat? Because red meat is the type of meat that is particularly rich in pro-oxidative and pro-inflammatory heme iron, which increases your risk of colorectal cancer, and also particularly rich in those polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, heterocyclic amines, and advanced glycation end products, all these pro-inflammatory, pro-oxidative carcinogenic substances that often um, uh, impose their effect on our health, their negative effects on our health by influencing our human gut microbiome. So I'm going to say red meat and eggs would be definitely the things to keep out of your, I don't want to use the word cheat meal, maybe you use that word, but if you're indulging once a week in, in, in some junk food, even animal-based junk food, those are the things I would avoid for sure. A couple of people now wondering about coffee and what effect that might have uh, on the gut microbiome. You mean this stuff, Chuck? That stuff right there, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> what effect is that having on your gut as we speak? Well, once again, it's just another plant, right? I mean, in terms of overall human health, the British Medical Journal published a great umbrella review about two or three years ago, looking at the effect of coffee intake on human health. And we always had this concept that coffee was your kind of type A stressed out personality would give you high blood pressure, maybe a heart attack, etc. But the evidence just doesn't support that. In fact, consuming coffee on maybe two or three cups a day is to help to reduce your risk of cancer, particularly liver cancer, and may also reduce your risk of coronary vascular disease. Now, when I look at those studies, I think, well, particularly for people who are reading a standard Western diet and aren't getting very many plants at all in their diet, uh, a cup of joe a few times a day is just bringing in all those phenols and those uh, beneficial phytochemicals that they otherwise wouldn't get. I mean, ultimately, this stuff is produced from beans, right? So it's a beneficial thing. In terms of your human gut microbiome, it's just more diversity for your gut microbiome to enjoy. But it is important to remember, Chuck, that for some people, caffeinated beverages can be an issue. Uh, the caffeine can both act to increase gut motility which is code word for sending you rushing for the bathroom a few times a day. Also, some people may be particularly uh, susceptible to the anxiety type side effects of caffeine and feeling anxious can also exert negative effects on your bowel habit and generate symptoms like irritable bowel syndrome. So if you're someone who's particularly sensitive to the caffeine effects, then maybe go for decaf or have a nice cup of tea or a, an herbal tea or something. So it's not necessary, but if you do enjoy coffee, and I do enjoy coffee, um, it's not going to have negative effects within reason. Two, one exception to that, of course, is um, during pregnancy, it's a good idea to keep your caffeine intake, intake low. So I think the experts would recommend maybe less than one cup of weak coffee per day if you are in the middle of a pregnancy. Recently on the show, we talked about a trend where people here, at least stateside, are eating way less 
food that has regular sugar in it, but are opting for uh, sweet alternative, zero calorie sweetener. So this goes to Phoebe's question at 1226. She writes, I've used Splenda for the past 10 years. And now I've read that that is bad for the microbiome. Other than stopping use, what can I do to fix my microbiome faster? So is there a connection there between Splenda and microbiome? Well, these artificial, so for 50 years now, Chuck, the food industry has been using artificially produced chemicals, things like maltodextrin, um, isosor, excuse me, um, polysorbate, uh, 90 carboxymethylcellulose, carrageenan, and all these artificial sweeteners, these artificial chemicals, food, which is junk, taste a little bit better, a bit sweeter like fruit perhaps, or give it an improved mouthfeel. And these artificial chemicals have no business whatsoever in the human gastrointestinal tract. They can induce negative effects on our gut microbiome. They can also act to degrade our gut lining's natural defenses and have direct effects where they reduce the integrity of this important layer of mucus that covers the intestinal lining and prevents bacteria and bacterial end products from adhering directly onto the lining, which is something you don't want to be happening on a regular basis. So you've given up this artificial sweetener. Excellent. I'm delighted to hear that. What else can you do? Well, whole food plant-based, a great variety is a great thing to increase improve your gut microbial diversity and to reduce the pro-inflammatory and harmful bacteria within your gut microbiome. But what else can you do besides food? A couple of things. Sleep is important. Getting your eight hours each night, really helpful. Uh, there are some researchers who believe that the human gut microbiome helps to set our daily rhythm, our diurnal rhythm. The bugs in our microbiome, act, they function on the same diurnal rhythm as we do. So get your eight hours sleep. It seems to help gut microbial diversity. Physical exercise is important. So getting exercise on a daily basis is important. Nice study a few years ago from the university I qualified from, University College Cork back in Ireland, where they showed that athletes, they were professional rugby players, had an increased amount of the friendly fiber-loving bacteria in the gut that ferment fiber and plants and produce beneficial compounds like short-chain fatty acids, regular exercise. And further research showed that he, and we don't have to be an elite athlete to get those benefits. Our gut microbiomes will benefit from regular exercise. Spending time in natural environments, our gut microbiome ultimately, Chuck, comes from our environment, from our surroundings, that we pick up these bugs from the environment that we spend time in. And by getting out in woodlands or gardens or forests or natural environments, you're getting, well, back to nature and you can improve your gut micro microbial diversity by spending time in nature. And the final thing I would say to improve your gut microbial diversity and to protect your gut microbiome. You've already removed this Splenda, this artificial product. You can also help your gut microbiome by just avoiding unnecessary medications, particularly unnecessary antibiotics. Now, antibiotics are wonderful. They have added years to our life expectancy. Without antibiotics, simple things like a dental infection or a chest infection would be almost universally fatal. But there are so many infections and problems that people will sometimes take an antibiotic, you know, just in case, just in case it gets worse. Or even when their doctor tells them, look, you don't need an antibiotic. If you don't need it, if your doctor thinks you don't need it, then don't take it. Take it if you need it. If you don't need it, don't take it. Unnecessary medications, including antibiotics, can have a pretty significant negative effect on the human gut microbiome. So those are maybe four or five other things you can do besides your food to improve your gut microbial diversity. All right, we spoke about kimchi. Let's talk about another popular K food, or in this case, a drink. Susan Song at 1231 wants to know, are you a fan of kombucha? Again, I like the taste. It's yummy. It's unusual. It can be quite sweet. It's got that little vinegary um, taste in it. Um, but I'm sorry to say the studies on the effect of kombucha on the human gut microbiome and the studies on the effects of kombucha on human health, I'm sorry, Chuck, they just don't convince me. So they're another interesting part of a varied uh, whole food plant-based diet. 
they're tasty. If you're out with friends and if like me, you don't drink any alcohol, maybe having a little kombucha is it make it marks the occasion. Um, so a nice social thing to do, but in terms of improving your health, I'm sorry, all you kombucha fans, um, I, I don't see the overall health benefit. So uh, Amelia, Amelia at 12. Yeah, you're breaking hearts today, man. Um, Amelia at 1231. I know. I, I was going to hold back <laughs> there, Chuck, but look, I'm going to go with the science. Yeah. <laughs> you got it. Man. Shoot straight. You you have to shoot straight. Uh, Amelia at 1231. I really try to eat a whole food plant-based diet, but I'm very sensitive to a lot of veggies. Also not able to do a lot of raw fruits and vegetables. Might have SIBO from my symptoms. I don't like meat, but have so little choices of food. Do you have any recommendations of how I might make that transition? Complicated question. Sure. Sure, it's a good question though. And I think, first of all, I would say that when people make the switch from a uh, standard Western diet to a healthy whole food plant-based diet, in 90 to 95% of cases, their gut health improves. They never come to see me. You know, they never go online, they never grumble about it, or, you know, because they're doing really, really well. And the science supports that. But for some people eating a healthier diet, particularly um, if they've grown up on a standard Western diet, and we know even the kind of healthy version of a standard Western diet may still only include, you know, 28 to 30 grams of fiber per day. When you make the switch to a healthy whole food plant-based diet, you may be consuming up to 45 grams of fiber per day. And with more fiber, comes more fermentation. It's a good thing. It's a healthy thing. With more fermentation comes more gas and more fluid and more liquid. And that can cause problems. That can cause digestive symptoms and discomfort, etc. What I would suggest to um, your listener or the person watching is that they might just have a little online search about FODMAPs. FODMAPs are these fermentable carbohydrates. They're called fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. They're in healthy foods as they should be. They are healthy things. Humans can't digest these carbohydrates. We depend on our gut microbiome to digest them for us. The human gut microbiome actually loves them. And when it's done with them, it generates lots of beneficial compounds, lots of short chain fatty acids. But for some people, certain uh, types of um, uh, FODMAP may be an issue. And it may be something as simple, Chuck, as slightly reducing one's intake of garlic, maybe avocado, and maybe you know fresh fruits and not overdoing it on either of those four things, which will generally reduce some of the most common FODMAPs that can be an issue. But we mentioned this on the podcast as well. So I do with my friends, Stephen and David Flynn, who are awesome plant-based chefs and Rosie Martin, an awesome plant-based dietitian. We run an online course called the Happy Gut Course, which specifically goes into that issue. Um, because FODMAPs are really healthy food, they are re really healthy things that are in really healthy foods. You don't find FODMAPs eggs or bacon or steak, which are super unhealthy foods. But for that reason, people who are experiencing those types of symptoms may find themselves making unhealthy choices with their diet because they feel like those foods aren't causing so much fermentation or so much bloating. And what we did with the Happy Gut course was that we set up this reduced FODMAP approach with all this online content about the human gut microbiome, but it's whole food plant-based from day one. So you're on a healthy, varied, whole food, plant-based diet, but you're also learning about which FODMAPs you tolerate well. Now, I have to say for most people, they won't need the Happy Gut course. And simply looking online at FODMAPs and maybe reducing them a little bit. Um, so for example, you may have someone who has avocado toast every single morning and they use garlic and onions in every single dish. And if that's you, then just reducing those may solve your problem. All right, time for a couple more. You good to take a couple more questions? I feel like you're on a roll here. I don't want to stop. No, that's okay. If I'm talking too much, just shut me down, Chuck, because once I start talking about health, I tend to, you know, go on a bit. Well, two things. One, when you speak, it's absolutely fascinating. Two, the more you talk, the easier my job becomes. So keep on talking, my friend. Keep on talking. <laughs> Give me the day off. You're uh, welcome. All right. So we spoke about <laughs> antibiotics uh, a little bit ago. Uh, AC at 1233 has a great follow-up. Wants to know, how can I improve my gut health after I take antibiotics? 
Absolutely. Well, look, if you need antibiotics, you need them. I, I, I don't want to test sure antibiotics are bad for you. They're really beneficial. And if you need an antibiotic, you need an antibiotic. But it does also affect your gut microbiome. And we spoke earlier, Chuck, about these things you can do. So a healthy, varied, whole food, plant-based diet, eating the rainbow, eating a complete variety of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, absolutely fantastic. We saw from the um, Human Gut Project, which was published just a few years ago, where they'd analyzed the gut microbiome of over 11,000 volunteers, predominantly from the US and the UK, but internationally. And what they found was that the number one dietary determinant of a healthy human gut microbiome is the diversity of plants in your diet. So focus on that first. And then the other things we mentioned, getting your eight hours sleep per night, um, avoiding other unnecessary medications or unnecessary antibiotics, getting some regular exercise, spending some time outdoors and natural environments. These will all give your gut microbiome the best chance of making a full recovery. Few people are wondering about the balance between raw foods and cooked foods and what the ratio should be in their diet. Do you have any insight on that? Well, one of the benefits of eating raw foods and raw fruits is that particularly with some raw fruits and vegetables, we had some questions earlier um, about probiotics and fermented foods, which I view as just like a tasty addition to your diet rather than something that's necessary. But this same beneficial bacteria can be found on the surfaces of many fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, so it's useful to have some raw fruits and vegetables that might just be snacking on apples and other fresh fruit, whatever's in season, or having just, you know, some crunchy vegetables on the table. But just like the overall message where, as you know, Chuck, certain nutrients are better absorbed from cooked food and certain nutrients are better absorbed from um, raw foods, so vitamin C comes best out of raw fruit and veg. Um, carotenoids, you absorb them a whole lot if being a cooked fruit or vegetable. So it's it's just a balance. And I think if you're getting fifty percent, if fifty percent of the food on your plate or fifty percent of the fruit in your shopping basket looks like a fruit or a vegetable whether you're cooking or raw, just whichever way you like it. I mean, the best fruit and vegetables to eat are the ones that you enjoy in variety. So I don't have a strict um, rule about how much cooked, how much raw, but it's, it's again, it's just good to mix it up and find your own way, whatever you, suits you, whatever you enjoy, and whatever keeps you eating those fruit and veg I'm happy with. All right. Now I said that we were going to get dirty during this segment and I'm, I'm going to be a man of my word here. <laughs> Susan song at 1241. Does one's stool reflect one's gut health? What is considered to be a healthy stool? Oh, what a great question. And as I said to you during the podcast uh, last week, Chuck, if people were more open about talking about their bowel habits, my job would be so much easier. <laughs> Everybody loves talking about food. Every Sunday supplement in the newspapers at the weekend has the restaurant reviews and the recipes and the food. But once we've swallowed the food, we're like just too embarrassed to talk about what happens. Everybody eats, everybody ferments, everybody poops. It's just a fact of life. So we should be, we should be comfortable talking about these things. So a really interesting um, little anecdote about this. So about 12 or 14 years ago at Bristol Royal Infirmary Hospital, which isn't too far from where I work and live here in the Southwest of England, they designed something called the Bristol Stool Chart. And if any of your guests want to really get into this, any of your listeners, just Google it up, the Bristol stool chart. And that shows a full color picture of everything from terribly hard constipated stool to a kind of a watery, mushy, unpleasant thing. And they graded those from types one through to five. And they, they determined that a type two or a type three stool the optimal stool, what we should all be aiming for. So that was maybe 15 years ago. So about three years ago, um, a team of gut microbiome researchers conducted a study to look at the correlation between gut microbial diversity and a healthy gut microbiome and the old Bristol stool chart. And guess what? They found that the type two to three stool also had the best microbial diversity. So for a gut health microbiome nerd like me, that is a beautiful circle 
more than a decade between the origination of the bristol stool heart when we didn't really know anything about the gut microbiome and this gut microbial study and yeah so a type two or three stool is where you want to be all right and final question comes to us from richard at twelve thirty six. wants to know what do you eat for breakfast on a typical day well, um, I vary it up. Um, I love oatmeal. So I'll have oatmeal several times per week. And during the winter months, I'll, I'll do like a hot oatmeal. Um, during the summer months, I'll do an overnight in the fridge, you know, with some fruit and dates. And sometimes I, sometimes, sometimes I make my overnight oats with coffee instead of plant milk because I get the coffee and the breakfast in a one go. But this morning, and what I've been having lately for breakfast is I get a nice slice of like a pumpernickel or rye bread, that really dark, dense German style stuff. And I'll toast it lightly, and then I'll cut it into on one half, I'll do like a mashed banana and some nuts. And on the other half, I'll do like some hummus and maybe some greens, uh, maybe some microgreens or or whatever, whatever's in the fridge, Chuck, you know, or some more, so I'll just have a little bit of my leftovers from lunch the previous day. So yeah, I, I mix it up quite a lot, actually. Tofu scrambles, another good one at the weekend when I've got a little bit more time to spend in the kitchen. Ah, that sounds heavenly. I'm coming. I'm going to book a ticket, fly all the way across the pond and come join you for breakfast. How about that? Well, I checked, Chuck, your exact, if you leave now, you can be here in 21 hours, according to Google Maps. Okay, so okay. I'll see you for breakfast. Sounds good. Yeah, all right. Well, I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, all right. Uh, okay, so uh, that's all the time that we have for the mailbag, but uh, you are going to be speaking, as we said, at ICNM, the International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine, and that kicks off tomorrow. We know that you're going to be speaking about Crohn's disease. You also mentioned that you're going to be speaking about a study that tracked 100 health professionals and how they were able to reduce their cardiovascular risk over the course of 28 days. Without giving too much away, can you tell us a little bit about what it is you're going to be talking about there and, and, and how this happened? So this was a project that I designed with my friends, Stephen and David Flynn of The Happy Pair and some local GPs in my area. So I talk a lot at local medical conferences and meetings with benefits for plant-based diet. I had the opportunity just before Christmas to speak at two huge conferences, mainstream medical conferences, and I did like a good hour, Chuck, on the benefits of a plant-based diet. I was speaking to GPs, family physicians, nurses, physiotherapists, dietitians. They were all omnivores, Chuck. Many of them had never heard of Dr. Bernard, if you can believe it. So I presented all of that research to them, all these benefits of a whole food plant-based diet. We talked about obesity and type two diabetes and heart disease and resistance and colorectal cancer and all of these conditions, which we in the Western world in high income countries view as inevitable. And I said, look, a whole food plant-based diet can prevent, halt, and even sometimes reverse these conditions. So I challenged them to take on a whole food plant-based diet with no calorie counting and no portion control, no measuring, just cooking and eating for 28 days. And I got them to track their body weight and their cholesterol and their blood pressure. And the results were pretty impressive. And as impressive as the results were, the real change was opening um, my colleagues' eyes to the benefits of this sort of dietary intervention. So it really lit a lot of enthusiasm in my local area, um, enthusiasm which we continue to build on because it, it's fantastic to get health professionals doing this. So we had a, over 100 health professionals take part in this challenge, but really we want to get these benefits to our patients. So we're, we're working on that right now. All right. Now, before I let you go, I, I absolutely need to ask you about the happy gut course that you're involved in. A lot of people in the chat box are, you know, raving about that. So for those who aren't familiar, tell us a little bit about that. So if you are someone who is eating a standard Western diet and you've been diagnosed with uh, irritable bowel syndrome or digestive health issues similar to that, if your doctor has told you that, and if your doctor or your gastroenterologist has said to you, ooh, you should try maybe this low FODMAP diet thing, you'll be disappointed to find when you look online that often a low FODMAP diet is an unhealthy diet, which depends on meat, eggs, and dairy for calories. So with the Happy Gut course, what we've done is we've taken the two things that can be really, really beneficial for irritable bowel syndrome. We've taken a high fiber, varied, whole food, plant-based diet, and we've combined that science 
with the science of FODMAP elimination and then stepwise introduction. So we have a six week plan, we have recipes, we have gradual reintroductions, we have food diaries, and the recipes are awesome. They're done by my friends, Stephen and David Flynn, who really know their way around a plant-based kitchen. And we also have, uh, so I'm in there supporting the group. We have Rosie Martin, my friend and colleague, who is an awesome plant-based uh, uh, plant dietitian. And the re although we put so much work, Chuck, into the recipes and the online content and the videos and the educational content, the real power of the Happy Gut Course has been our incredible online community. So we have four and a half thousand people in that online community now who are all trying to or aiming to improve their digestive health while eating more plants. So thanks for asking about the Happy Gut Course. It's been a real pleasure for me to be involved in it. Um, so every day we, we, I'm getting these awesome messages from people taking, bar, taking part in the Happy Gut course, and we've had some tremendous success with it. All right. And you are also a mandatory follow on Instagram, a great account at dr.alandesmond. You need to go give the man a follow. He is a social media star and he absolutely, as he just showed, knows what it is that he's talking about. So Dr. Desmond, thanks so much for taking the time today. Can't wait to see what you have in store for us at ICNM. Oh, Chuck, great. Talk to you soon, buddy. I appreciate it. All right, my friend, you take care. And you remember that today is the final day to take advantage of the 20% discount exclusively for exam room viewers. All you need to do to register to see Dr. Desmond's presentations and Dr. Barnard and everyone else, head over to pcrm.org slash ICNM, click that registration link and use the promo code exam20, lowercase though, exam and then the number 20 to save 20% off the cost of registration three days to nurse out about nutrition like you never have before. I promise you, it is going to be amazing. All right, now, time to get caught up on what is happening with the world. Here are your health headlines for Wednesday, August 5th, 2020. We start with the latest on the coronavirus here in the U.S. Dr. Barnard was talking a little bit about this earlier. Uh, 53,000 new cases were reported on Tuesday. Now, that is up from Monday, but still, we are on a downward trajectory compared to previous weeks and below the 58,000 cases that have been averaged over the last seven days. Meanwhile, the number of deaths, though, saw its biggest single day jump in weeks with more than 1,300 lives lost. The country has been averaging more than 1,000 deaths a day for the past 10 days. Meanwhile, the resurgence in cases isn't limited to here in the U.S. as European countries are also in the midst of a rash of new infections. The outbreaks are causing some countries, such as Ireland, to pause plans for reopening. Germany, Spain, France, and Greece are among the other countries grappling with a new surge of of infections, while cases in the Netherlands nearly doubled over the past week. Here's some good news, though. Being vegan is proving to be cost effective during the pandemic. While the price of meat and dairy is skyrocketing at the grocery store, produce prices are remaining relatively stable, according to new figures that have been released by the government. Since February, Check this out. Since February, the price of beef and veal have soared by more than 20%. And the cost of eggs, that's up 10%, while people are paying 9% more for chicken and pork. However, for the health conscious shoppers who are they are finding far less sticker shock in the produce section increases for vegetables have been limited to 4% while fresh fruit prices have jumped just 2%. Cool stuff, right? And one of the fruits that you may want to add to your next grocery list is blueberries. A new study finds they can improve muscle regeneration in young women. Cornell researchers asked a small group of women to eat freeze-dried blueberries twice a day for six weeks, finding improvements in regeneration. Now, the improvements were not seen in women over the age of 60, but research has previously shown that the little blue, <laughs> the little blue fruits can be beneficial for heart and brain health, as well as diabetes and the gut microbiome. The study was funded by the Blueberry Council and is published in the Journal of Nutrition. I had blueberries with my oats this morning. I seriously, I love those things, man. Blueberries, frozen blueberries, so versatile, great in smoothies. And then you can put them on top of hot oatmeal and that'll help cool it down faster. 
I, 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 do you eat blueberries today? How often do you guys eat blueberries? Let me know real quick in the chat box. I suspect that it is one of the more popular fruits out there. Okay. Uh, as we wrap things up, I just want to remind you of the speakers that will be at ICNM. So we've talked about Dr. Desmond, then we've got Dr. Neil Barnard. He will be there talking about a bunch of things, including including a presentation. He's going to be teaming up with Dr. Christy Cobb to talk about nutrition and sex hormones. And then Dr. Michael Greger will also be presenting, as will Dr. Kim Williams, the super fun rock star doc from New York, Dr. Shivam Joshi. He was on the exam room podcast not too terribly long ago. He will be talking about the connection between kidney health kidney disease, and plant-based diets. And Dr. Vanita Rahman, she's going to be there talking about nutrition and hypertension and how a plant-based diet scientifically, we're going to drill down on this scientifically, can help lower blood pressure with that. And I've talked about this one all week, and I'm so looking forward to this. Doctors Walter Willett and David Katz on day two of the conference, they will be giving a talk called What's Behind Nutrition Controversies? making sense of the science. How great is that? They're going to clear a whole bunch of stuff up for us on Friday at ICNM. So to register right now, head over to pcrm.org slash ICNM. And again, use that promo code exam20 to register. This is the final day to get that discount. For the first time ever, the conference is exclusively online. It runs Thursday through Saturday and your nutrition IQ will be raised. I guarantee I guarantee that IQ is going up by at least three, four, maybe as many as five points. It's going to be fantastic knowledge. I hope to see you there. Now, quick show note, we will be starting early tomorrow because of ICNM. Showtime normally at noon, but tomorrow we will be starting at 9 a.m. Eastern time. So have breakfast with us. Dr. Barnard, he's going to be back on the show, as will dietitian Susan Levin. And Dr. Yami, she will be making her exam room live debut. And we're all going to be taking a look at the new dietary guidelines, where things stand with that, what's the latest. Susan has been following that closely. And then we're also going to be looking at dairy and what the guidelines are likely to be saying about dairy. And this comes on the heels of the resurgence of the Got Milk campaign. So we got to clap back with some real facts and not slick marketing. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing on the show tomorrow. Remember, starting at 9 a.m. Eastern, right back here on Facebook and on YouTube. And lastly, and lastly, if you need a little bit of inspiration today, you need a little pick-me-up, head over to Apple Podcast or Spotify or Stitcher, wherever shows are available, and grab the latest episode of the Exam Room Podcast by the Physicians Committee. Now, the show, that episode title itself is Can, COVID's, <laughs> Can Vegans Get COVID-19? But in the second segment, as I'm speaking with Eric O'Gray, we get to talk about his 97-year-old mother-in-law, Josephine. Now, Josephine was in a hard way, had a whole host of medical issues, not walking a whole heck of a lot, was very sedentary, even a little bit cantankerous. You know, she had a bit of a cranky personality, but then she moves in with Eric and his wife, adopts a whole food plant-based diet within five weeks. Josephine, you see her right there on the screen. Within five weeks, doctors had taken her off of her medication and she was up and she was walking two to three miles every single day. And so when you think to yourself, it's too late for me to do this. It's too late for me to change. Think about Josephine. She was 96 when she made this change. And in just five weeks, how much her health improved. It's a remarkable conversation. So head over to Apple Podcast or Spotify. Hit that subscribe button when you find the exam room podcast by the Physicians Committee. And if you would be so kind as to also leave a five-star rating, we would greatly appreciate it. And I appreciate you being here today. And I also appreciate Dr. Alan Desmond for joining us and to the crew behind the scenes that makes the show possible. Our director is Donna Steele and our producer is Laura Anderson. And on behalf of Dr. Neil Barnard and everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thanks so much for tuning in today. And until tomorrow morning, stay safe, take a stand, and keep it plant-based.